Welcome to the future. Today, we are at the point in history when we are the most technologically advanced society ever. We have robots that are using computers, making surgery so precise that they are, the incisions are smaller than the uh, breadth of a human hair. We communicate with the speed of light. I have it at my house. It's a wonderful thing, fiber internet. We also, using devices like these, are able to communicate to other people across the world using radio waves. Or you could use the radio waves to cook your Hot Pockets. But the thing about it, all of this wonderful technological advancement is we are at a point in history when we are at our worst communicationally. Interpersonal communication is at its all-time low. Uh, the running joke is, you know, two people sitting in the same room texting each other rather than talking. I work in information security. Specifically, uh, I have been focused for the last year and a half in social engineering. And we developed these models, uh, one of which is also used by the FBI. It's called the Behavioral Change Stairway Model. As you can see, the behavioral change stairway model is designed for hostage negotiations, really high stress situations like that. But we also use it in counseling. We also use it in social engineering. And it's something that is wonderful, very effective in interpersonal communications. As you can see, the steps rise through here. You've got active listening, empathy, rapport, influence, and behavioral change as the final result. We're going to talk about all of these. First off, we need to discuss what active listening is, all right? This is a really, really complicated definition. Are you guys ready? Are you ready? It's to listen actively. <laughs> you can look. This is the Japanese word for active listening. Using your ear, you, your eyes, your undivided attention to your heart. Now, the point of active listening is that we are hearing what the person is saying, but we're not just understanding the words, we're letting it sink in. Psychologist and social engineer Michelle Fenster said, it is fully concentrating on the social interaction, fully concentrating on what is being said, rather than just the speaker or looking for a way to respond. When the techniques you use for active listening, they're not anything revolutionary. You start out with listening to what is being said. Revolutionary concept, right? But not only that, acknowledge what is being said. Keep your mind focused. Keep yourself engaged. Yes, I understand. Uh-huh. Things like that are simple conversation movers, but it tells the other person, I am being listened to. I am important. Don't fidget with your phone. Don't give them half your attention. On top of that, acknowledge the things that are being said. Repeat them back. Don't be mocking. You know, you can always tell when somebody's kind of teasing you. Oh, so this is what you're actually saying, right? You always see the joke as they lean forward and, so, sorry. Whenever I'm teasing something, it's got to be a full body thing. Uh, but not only this, the pros over at Social Engineer also will give a few tips. One is watch the body language. Pay attention to how they're moving, but don't get lost in it, right? Because there's a disjoint in body language, and we detect it even without training. It's instinctive. But it's very, very easy to just go down that rabbit hole, especially when you start to learn how to do it. Number two. Don't interrupt. Let them speak. Everybody has got their own story. We are the heroes of our own story, like we saw in the earlier TED Talk. Give them the chance to tell you, and then find a way to fit into that story. Number three, keep your mind engaged. Don't let it drift. Don't kind of wander off. Uh, my wife is here, and she can tell many, many stories about she'll be telling me something, and uh-huh, yeah. And I've just shut off. The brain is no longer clicking. I'm thinking about, hey, what's for dinner? Don't do that. 
That is not active listening. And all of this moves to develop empathy. Now, empathy is developed out of two words. M pathos, to feel within, right? So your goal with empathy and your goal with active listening is to feel in yourself what the other person is feeling. You do that by beginning to imagine yourself in the same scenarios, giving yourself the, the space to hear what they're hearing, to experience what they have experienced. Uh, we are seeing uh, right now in the modern world a lot of discussion about how there's people who are middle class, white, they are not going to be able to understand the experience of someone of another culture or heritage. That's the goal of empathy. I may not be able to understand what one of the girls in India is experiencing, but I can try my best to understand and to empathize and to feel within myself what they must be feeling, and it will help me to communicate more effectively to them. So, we've talked about listening. Now here's the part where you start to become active. Rapport building. I think that's a beautiful picture, personally. Uh, rapport building is a series of events that you're using to build emotional equity with another person, to get the privilege of speaking into their life. Now, I work with at-risk kids a lot in my spare time. Uh, so breaking into a building, your goal with rapport is immediate. You want it fast. You need to be able to get this person to trust you just enough to let you walk into that building with no questions asked. Cool. However, rapport with kids is a little bit unique, but the principles are the same. Let me read you a quote real quick. This quote comes from Robin Dreek. Before I use these techniques or send out any class to pr practice these techniques, I remind myself and them of one everlasting rule that will dramatically increase your probability of success. It is all about them. The only goal I have, either for myself or the individuals I teach, is that in every interaction, the other person should walk away feeling much better for having met you. You should brighten their day and listen to them when no one else would. Build that connection where others wouldn't, and you will have mastered both conversation and rapport. Keep that in the back of your mind, because that's going to come back to us. So there are 10 basic techniques of rapport. Uh, and Dreek was actually asked, hey, how's, how do you develop rapport? And apparently he wrote these 10 out on a napkin during lunch one day. So number one, establish an artificial time constraint. Establish any kind of time constraint. Even if you're just saying, oh, this will only take just a moment of your time, it establishes to that person, hey, you respect my time, you're not going to waste it, so I only have to listen to you for this period. It's a pretty effective manner. The number two, body language. Here we come back to body language. Hmm, it's almost like body language is an important part of the way that human beings communicate. Shocking, right? So, watch their body language, but also watch yours. Make sure that your body language is lining up with what you're saying. You know, keep those internet memes in the back of your mind. Don't let them kind of creep forward. You know, somebody's telling you, oh man, my dog just passed away and I'm really, really struggling with it. Be like, okay, dog passed away, serious. Body language, sullen, calm. Don't be like, yeah, it's kind of like the dog that has, I have no idea what I'm doing meme. <laughs> yeah, if you're smiling when somebody's saying that, it's not going to build rapport very effectively. Number two, or number three, excuse me, speak slowly, unlike what I'm doing. When you speak slowly, the human mind has the ability to process what is being said. We're not responding on something called amygdala hijacking. And you can dig into uh, Chris Hadnagy's speeches on uh, amygdala hijacking, wonderful stuff. But if you speak slowly, we tend to trust people more. If you slow down to a manageable level, all of a sudden you're able to process what I am saying as I say it. However, the opposite of that is the old colloquialism, boy, that salesman was a fast talker. You ever been to a car lot? Anybody 
Yeah, we were there a couple weeks ago and it was just a nightmare. The guy spoke so quickly, you're like, what? Am I buying a car or is this an auction? Don't be afraid to ask for help, right? Sympathy themes as a part of human nature are very effective. We, by our nature, are extremely social animals. We want to help. We want to reach out to another person and we want to be able to be the hero. You know, how many of you in here have been children? You know, as a kid, didn't tie a towel around your neck and dun -da -da, dun -da 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 -da. How many of you jumped off of the roof of your house thinking that you were Superman and could fly? <laughs> so sometimes heroism doesn't quite work. But don't be afraid to ask for help. And in order to ask for help comes the next technique, ego suspension. Here we come circling back. It's not about you. Effective communication stops being about you. It becomes about the other person. It becomes us. I'm no longer trying to be the main character of the story. I'm trying to be a part of your story. And that one, in my experience, has been far and away the most effective. Allow yourself to be taught. You don't get the last word. Ask open-ended questions, which is another technique. Who, what, when, where, how, why, how? I mean, not all of those are gonna apply in a single situation. Some of them are gonna be kind of sporadic. But the thing is, when you are open-ended in your questioning, the people are going to be more responsive in giving answers. They're more willing to open up because, hey, guess what my favorite topic to talk about is? Me! And I'd go to bet that it's probably your favorite topic to talk about too. validate their feelings. Doesn't matter if it's the most off the wall, insane thing. This person could be wearing a tinfoil fedora. Validate what they're feeling. You know, I understand how you would feel that way. It goes back to empathy. If we validate what they're feeling, they're gonna be more willing to tell us what they're feeling. Quid pro quo, something for something. Uh, again, this goes back to partially my experience with kids, partially my experience as a social engineer. You know, I, we would do something called vishing, which is uh, calling a company posing as an attacker. And, hi, my name is Jim Johnson. Immediately, I have given them something of mine. You now have not only my first name, but my last name. So, if I ask you to verify your identity, you're going to be more socially inclined to say, Oh yes, that's my name. Or if I greet you, hi, my name's Brian, Brian Austin. You're going to be more inclined to give me your first and last name. It's a fascinating principle. With kids, if you give them respect, this isn't 100%, but my experience, again, if you give a person respect, they are more inclined to give it back. On top of that, give a gift. You know, if you walk up to somebody, even if it's something that you plan to take back, you know, like a clipboard, a pen, you know, here, hi, my name's Brian Austin, you know, could you hold this for me? You know, it, automatically we start to want to talk more. There was some research done uh, by a guy named Robert Cialdini, and we'll talk about him in a second, but when he gave people something to hold, like a clipboard to sign, they were more inclined to actually work with him and to give him more information. Gifts come in all shapes and sizes. Be aware of that. And the last one is manage your own expectations. How many of you have gone into something with the anticipation, hey, this is gonna be awesome, I'm gonna just kill it, yeah! We're gonna get this presentation and it's gonna rock. And then you get up there and it just goes, Automatically, your whole body language changes. You go from bouncy to you start to close and shut down. Manage your expectations because your disappointment will show on you like a brightly lit sign in the middle of the night. All of this moves into influence. All right, I've got another quote for you. Hold on. Dr. Robert Cialdini said, 
My sense of the proper way to determine what is ethical is to make a distinction between a smuggler of influence and a detective of influence. The smuggler knows these six principles and then counterfeits them, bringing them into situations where they don't naturally reside. The opposite is the sleuth's approach, the detective's approach to influence. The detective also knows what the principles are and goes into every situation aware of them, looking for the natural presence of one or another of these principles. Fascinating stuff. So, influence is actually the act of leading someone to want to make a change. You use influence, uh, you know what, let's stop here for a second, and, and let's talk about what he's discussing. There is a difference between influence and manipulation, right? And it, we can all just kind of relate to manipulation. We, we've all dealt with toxic people in our lives, we've dealt with manipulative salespeople, whatever. And the manipulative, mani manipulation techniques are coercion, threats, blackmail, and sometimes manufacturing of influence. The goal of a manipulator is to obtain your compliance to their desires. It's not to necessarily better you, it's to better myself. So, let's draw that line really early. Number one rule, number one point to be made in influence, reciprocity. Remember when we were talking about rapport, quid pro quo. Something for something. If I give you something, you're more inclined to give me something. We go back to the name instance. If I give you my name, you're going to be more inclined to give me yours. I can influence you to do something along the lines of what I am hoping to achieve in you by giving you something in return. And then the next point, consistency. Remain consistent. Don't flake out. Don't... Follow through, have follow through, right? How many people know somebody that, you know, oh yeah, I'll totally be there, I am down, and nothing. You, it's hard to trust that person. And not only that, it's hard to let that person speak into your life with any degree of authority. And next up, we're going to talk about social proof. I mean, we all know the social proof. Uh, I have a six-year-old. And uh, I, I caught myself becoming my parents last week. Uh, my son was like, but all the other boys are doing it in the neighborhood. And I was like, yeah, and if all the other boys in the neighborhood were jumping off of the roof, would you do it? Uh, swore I'd never do that, but what can I say? <laughs> Next point is liking. All right, I want everybody to raise their right hand. All right. So a lot of you guys have been chuckling at my jokes, as bad as they are, uh, and when I asked you to do something, nobody hesitated. You can put them down, you're good. Uh, I wanted to demonstrate a point. You, you kind of relate to me. You kind of like what I'm having to say. I made you chuckle, so you're like, hey, you, you know, why not? Let's see what he's doing. If you like me, you're more likely to listen to me. Be likable, and to be likable is to be like someone. Uh, there was a study done on relationships, and it said that most relationships flourish. Oh, I am on the wrong side. Sorry. I couldn't think of a better image for influence than this. But likability is based on proximity and similarity, right? So the closer you are and the more similar you are, the more you are going to like one another. Again, it comes back to our favorite topic to talk about is ourselves. If somebody is very similar to us, they must be a pretty decent person because I know I am. <laughs> yeah. Now we move into authority. Now this one's really, really tricky because a lot of people misread this. Now authority is not being in authority, it is being an authority. Now the trick is, I am given to you as an authority. So I am now looking at you with a degree of understanding and knowledge in this. Uh, in this particular area. So, the change that you're hoping to experience is going to happen based on that. It all leads to a behavioral change. The final result is the point. We have to make sure that we know what our goal is. The goal is changing people. In my world, 
It's to gut insecurities and hurts in people. It's to take the life of a kid who has been told by the whole world, you're never going to accomplish anything, and say, hey, you know what? You can do anything you want if you work hard at it. I'm going to walk with you and I'm going to help you. Behavioral change is like a butterfly coming out of a chrysalis. Person has to want to change, but you can help influence that. Come back to this quote. The only goal that I have for either myself or the individuals I teach is that in every interaction, the other person should walk away feeling much better for having met you. I would take that a step further and say, your goal should be that the other person becomes better for having met you. Now, go out, find someone, find yourself, and be the change you want to be, see in the world.